you have a Bible tonight, open to the 58th chapter of the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 58. We'll look at one verse there tonight. Uh, as many of you remember, as we've looked at Isaiah there, chapter 9, uh, for the last few Sunday mornings, getting ready for Christmas, um, we talked about the setting of the book of Isaiah and how Isaiah is writing and, and Isaiah is prophesying against the nation of Israel concerning their captivity. Uh, and as you go through the book of Isaiah, you can see that there are some shifts uh, in his passion, not that he changes, uh, that he's concerned for everybody, uh, but he starts addressing uh, somewhat of the remnant, I guess you could say, as you get through the book. Uh, and in this chapter, Isaiah is writing to the Lord's people, the remnant who are suffering, uh, those who are hurting. And what he's trying to do here is encourage them and, and I, I empower maybe would be the right word, but trying to build them up and edify them to endure through hardship, but also remembering that enduring through hardship does not mean that we take our foot off the pedal with ministry. And so what he's telling them and encouraging them is that even in trial and even in suffering, there's ministry. And what we've found is there's never been more churches started in the United States of America than during the Great Depression. What we find is, is a lot of times suffering gives way to great things. A lot of times it's suffering that, that gets us in a place where we can listen and where we can be blessed, and where we can be used. And so it's an incredible thing at how, how God, and God doesn't intend for us or want us or take pleasure in our suffering, but because of sin and because of our fallen nature, we're going to suffer. And it just so happens that the Bible says that God can work together good to anything. <laughs> to anybody that loves God and called according to his purpose, that he can work all things together for good. And so he can bring, even out of sorrow, he can bring good stuff. Even out of heartache and out of suffering, he can bring good stuff. And so what Isaiah is driving at the people here, we're just going to look at one verse tonight, but what Isaiah is driving at these people here is about being charitable and about, even in dry seasons, being willing to, to give. And so that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Let me read my verse, and then we'll give you kind of a title. But verse 11, it says, And the Lord shall guide thee continually and satisfy thy soul in drought and make fat thy bones and thou shalt be like a watered garden and like a spring of water whose waters fail not. Father, bless this word tonight. Have your way in Jesus' name. Amen. God's word to those who live to give. And I'm not just talking about uh, financial giving and, and padding people's pockets and, and things like that. And though that's a blessing. But having that heart of generosity where it's not necessarily a, a monetary thing even though it might be money. The thought of giving is just a part of that life and a part of that person. And what he's telling these people is that even during this dry season, even in the seasons of life that it's not easy to give, even in the seasons, even in the seasons of life it's not easy to minister, even in the seasons of life it's not easy to pour out blessings on people, he says keep pouring and keep doing and keep giving and keep going because God's going to bless you for it. And you find that in those times it seems like God will bless you the most is when you had the, the least to give and you gave it. When you had the, the, the least amount of effort or whatever it could be. I mean, you ever put your hand to something that you knew you weren't qualified to do? <laughs> that you knew you had no business doing? But somehow in the midst of all of it, the Lord's still blessed? That, that's what I, You had to go back to Sibley with me to hear people talk about how they still can't believe. I don't go back to Sibley. I go every year and preach. And every year I go, everybody comes up, I have a dozen people, and sometimes the same ones that can forget they've been saying it for 15 years. As I, I still just can't believe you're a preacher. <laughs> like, well, believe it, I'm here, right? <laughs> here I am, got the boots to show it. <laughs> Come on. And so, beautiful are the feet of those that preach the gospel, especially tonight. Can I get a witness in here? <laughs> Amen. And so, <laughs> when you think about that, you, you realize that it's not necessarily about our qualification. And it's not necessarily about our supply. And it's not necessarily about what we bring to the table. It's a spiritual matter concerning the heart of man and the mind of God, and that is whether or not we're willing to sacrifice. Whether or not we're willing to look at a situation and see how we can be a blessing. Because it's real easy for me to look at a situation and see how I can't be a blessing. And I ain't got no business with that, right? It's easy for me to look and say, hey, you know, they're going to be all right. They'll have to work it out. Surely God will send somebody, right? And be praying for God to provide. Well, in this case, what Isaiah is saying is that even though you're hurting, and even though you're suffering, 
Remember that God sent you to be the people of God. God sent you to be his chosen people. God sent you to do the work that God's called you to do. So a few things in that one verse that we'll notice tonight. Somewhat of a devotional thought for our message, but I hope it'll be a blessing to you. I want you to see, first of all, the guiding hand of God. As he makes this statement, opening the thing, that the Lord shall guide thee continually. There's something about, and I can say this sincerely. I can say this with all sincerity. The more willing you are to be sensitive to the leadership of the Lord, the more you're going to hear from him and the more you're going to see him work. The more that you're willing to say, all right, I'll do it, even though you might not be qualified, you might not be prepared, you might not have the, the, the pockets to get it done, the more that you are willing to listen and look to every situation and realize that maybe that's something I can be a blessing in, maybe that's somewhere that I can help, maybe that's somewhere that I could. the more you do stuff like that, the more you're going to see God show up in situations and bless your socks off and help you in so many ways and you do not understand. And I know a little bit of money sometimes doesn't necessarily help people. It doesn't do a whole lot for people even though the, the gesture is, is usually more than the actual financial donation that means something to somebody. To be able to, to know that somebody loved them enough to try. Loved them enough to care for them. I, I had a guy that sent for me the other day. He, wanted, wanted, he said, asked me if I'd come visit him. I went the next day. And spent a, a little over an hour with him just visiting. And when I left, he let me know how much it meant to him. And it basically was he wanted to see if I would come or not. And it didn't matter what we talked about or what we did. It was whether or not I was willing to show up. And the fact of the matter is, it, it, is everything in ministry is kind of like that. Is, is people out there today, there's a lot of questions and there's a lot of doubt and there's a lot of pushback. But the fact of the matter is, you can override a whole bunch of bad heretical teaching that's messed people's minds up if you can get to their heart. You, you can bypass all that. People that are hurt, people that are sub, people that deny the gospel and deny the truth and deny the church, if they see the church in its ministry and they see the, the ministering hand of the people of God, it will wipe away. If, if the Bible says love will wash away a multitude of sin, it, it'll take away that, that edge that's on people and they'll see something in you that's real. They'll see something in you that's, that, that'll minister to those people. I talked to somebody one day and they were telling me about somebody living on the lake. And now they live down the crookedest hollow you've ever seen in your life, way around the other side of the lake. But they said something about, they had talked to him about going to church, and they said, we ain't never had a preacher come by our house. I said, what's their address? <laughs> and so I went over there and drank coffee with them and visited with them for an hour. And, and it was just, just to show them that people love them. And the lady said that while I was there. She said, you know, you're the first preacher ever come by our house. I said, well, I'll say this to the defense of every preacher in this community. you got to be coming here on purpose. <laughs> This ain't somebody you just ride by and think, you know what, I'm going to stop in. I mean, y'all way down in here. I got lost twice getting down in there. Something about just going that extra mile and just loving people and just trying to help people and be a blessing to people in spite of the fact that they might not deserve it, in spite of the fact that you might not be able to do it, if you just make that effort, you'll see the guiding hand of God. And God will guide you into some stuff that you never believe. I've seen it in my own ministry. I've heard time and time again from people who've seen that very thing and there's something to be said about continual guidance. Because there are some times that God might guide you in places you don't want to go. But you're going to need to go do that. There will also be some times in your ministry or your life or your walk with God, you're going to really need God to guide you. And it wouldn't hurt to already have that relationship established. It wouldn't hurt to have the GPS plugged in and programmed before you get lost, right? In our relationship with God, seeking that guidance from the Lord, if, if we're willing to be guided by the Lord in the times that we don't think we need it, then we're sure going to have him there in the times that we do. And we can trust that that's going to be there, and we don't have to worry about that. I love that he says that, and the Lord shall continually guide thee, and listen, satisfy thy soul. That means that in the, in the guiding places of the Lord, wherever he takes us, and the things that he does for us, and the places that he uses us, he's going to satisfy us. He's going to take care of us. He's going to meet the need of our life. He's going to meet, you've heard all the cliche things of where, where he leads, he feeds, and where God guides, he provides. And the reason those became cliche in the church and overused is because it's true. <laughs> where he, where, what is it? Where he leads, he feeds. I already said that one, didn't I? And so God takes care of his people. And if we're willing to be sensitive to the guidance of the Lord in the times that we don't necessarily want to be guided, then there's going to come times we need to be guided that he's going to be there. And what's so beautiful about what Isaiah is telling these people is not only is he going to guide you, but while he guides you, he's going to satisfy the needs of your life. That you don't have to worry. You don't have to worry about what's going to do this. See, we've got a bad problem, especially in our, in our sophisticated society, 
is we need to see everything on paper, and we need to know whether there's the end to the means. We need to know all this kind of stuff. And sometimes you've got to throw logic out the door and just follow Jesus, and you'll find that he'll bless you there too. It's not to be irresponsible. It's not to be irreverent. It's not to be ignorant or, or not be good stewards of what the Lord's give you, but it's just to know that God's good enough that if he's provided for me once, he can do it again. If God got me to this place one time, he can get me to this place again. Don't ever be so proud as to think that your blessings came because of you. As if you do, you're going to rob yourself of being a blessing to somebody else because you think you've got to hoard all of it up because you think, I'll never do this again. Well, you didn't do it the first time, sweetheart. God's the one that's blessed you. God's provided for you. God's give you what you've got, and you ought to ever be thankful for that and ever be willing to lay it all on the altar of God and be willing to, to, to surrender yourself to his guidance and say, Lord, wherever you lead, I'll go. Adrian Rogers, some of you I know know him. Adrian Rogers made the statement one time that we can sing a lie as well as we can tell one. <laughs> and you think about some of the songs that we sing. I thought about that. Whenever, wherever you lead, I'll go. That's a tall order. And sometimes you say that. And I'll, I'll be honest with you. The day that I surrendered to preach, I, I, I was willing. I, I said it to the Lord, I, I, whatever you want me to do. And if that had been Antioch or if that had been Africa, that's where I was going. Because I knew God had called me to preach. And I was going to do whatever God told me to do. And that was an incredible thing in my heart. It's a liberating thing when you can throw caution to the wind and throw your hands up and know that I'm resting in the sovereignty of God and I'm going to go do whatever you want me to do wherever you want me to do it. Now, he only sent me about 80 miles from home, which I'm thankful for. Amen? But he could have sent me anywhere and I'd have been willing to do it, to do whatever God wanted me to do. He said, wherever I'm going to guide you, I'm going to satisfy your need. Wherever I send you, wherever I take you, wherever I lead you, and you can say this... I told you the first time I preached a sermon, it was about seven or eight minutes long. I said everything I had wrote down on a piece of paper twice. I cried my way all the way home. I said I was the biggest idiot that ever stood in a pulpit ever in the history of the world. That was the dumbest thing I've ever done. I'll never do it again. I prayed and said, God, I'm sorry. I, I made a fool of myself. And you know, about three months later, he opened another door for me, and I got up and preached, and I preached about 20 minutes. And then I preached about 30 minutes, and then, you know, I've gone over an hour before. You won't believe that. And didn't say anything twice. <laughs> But God, God will supply, and he's going to satisfy whatever you do, wherever you go. If you're doing it in the hand of God, he's going to take care of you. The guiding hand of God, and the second thing you see in that verse is the giving hand of God. And this kind of goes back to what he says, I'm going to satisfy your soul. He's talking about provision. He's going to satisfy your soul, and he's going to bring fatness, he said, to your bones. That means he's going to give strength to your bones. He's going to give you Strength. He's going to supply for you, and that's what he says there. Satisfy thy soul in drought and make fat thy bones. I'm going to satisfy thy soul in drought. That means in the deepest, darkest, driest seasons of your life, I'm going to meet your need. I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to provide what you stand in need of. And you know there's something about life, you're going to go through some dry seasons. You're going to go through some times that it's not there. You've all heard the expression, you're going to have that time where you got more month than you do money. <laughs> And you're sitting there for the last week or two weeks or three weeks or four weeks, right? And you're trying to figure out how you're going to make it. And it's an amazing thing if you've ever been in that place and you've seen the Lord bless. And you've seen how the Lord provided. And you've seen how the Lord moved in your situation. Or if you've seen other people, prayed with other people and seen how God blessed in their life and moved in their situation, whatever that may be. It's an incredible thing to see God move when he's guiding people and using things. And it's so easy for us to dismiss God. And it's so easy for us to stumble out into a day and wonder where God is and wonder how, you know, everybody's so mad and everybody's so bitter and nobody loves Jesus and nobody cares about God. But if you clear all that out of, your, out of your head, right, and you open your eyes, you can see God everywhere you go. If you open your eyes and you slow down, you can see God in everything you do. He provides everything that we need. He's so good to us. And what Isaiah is trying to drive to these people is that in the dry season, don't quit serving. Don't quit ministering. Don't quit giving. Don't quit doing. Don't quit doing what I've put you here and God's called you here to do. You've got to trust that even in suffering, even in bondage, even in captivity, that God had a plan. And that God was going to navigate them through that plan and bless these people just like we know that through our heartache and heart seed, that's how you can go to people in their darkest hour and tell them there's still hope in Jesus Christ. Because God can guide you through that and God can bless you and give you what you need and give you the blessings that you stand in need of in order to navigate you through whatever the, the dark situation or drought in your life may be. God's word to those who live to give, he talks about that guiding hand, that giving hand of God. As he says there, that God's going to satisfy the need of our soul, he's going to make fat thy bones, and he's going to do it in drought. And then the third thing I want you to see tonight is 
the generational hand of God. One of the things that, that we, we've got to always, always, always process and remember is God doesn't bless you just to bless you. God doesn't bless the church just to bless the church. If God blesses the church, he wants to bless through the church. If God gives you a blessing, he wants to bless through that blessing. He doesn't want to just, and when you talk about, I've heard him use this, that reason I use this word, generational hand to God. I've heard people say, I remember when Drew Brees, uh, the quarterback for the Saints, anybody? <laughs> Who should not have been on the sideline today, apparently. But Drew Brees got hurt before his rookie contract ran out. So he didn't get the big contract on the payday like everybody does on their first big contract. So he had to go through the process, get his shoulder fixed. The Saints picked him up. They paid him the cheap salary for football. Not, not cheap for us, right? <laughs> but a cheap salary for football, not necessarily, not near what he deserved or what he would, could have earned if he would have, if he had known what he was going to be. So he didn't get the salary that time either. So his first two contracts were not the big mega bucks contract. And so when he came up for his next contract in New Orleans, he's negotiating a deal for $100 million. And, of course, everybody says, well, I you know, play football for a million dollars. They're overpaid and all that. Everybody's overpaid except you. <laughs> right? And I agree. I, I mean, I think it's silly how much money they make in football, but they make that because they're, they're worth that. That's the money they bring in. That's the, the revenue stream that they're bringing in to all those teams and all those programs and all that. But I remember them using the term that Drew Brees is right to negotiate because that's generational wealth. That's the type of money that he can have and, and set up his kids and set up his grandkids and start businesses and start all this stuff that there will be for years and years to come because of that one man and because of what he was able to accomplish, there will be things that will, will precipitate from that that will bless generations to come. Now that's just a financial mindset of one man. That turns out Drew Brees is a Christian and Drew Brees is a good man. He's a good husband and a good father and he's probably going to do a lot of wonderful things with all the things that God's blessed him with. A lot of people have money, don't do that. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, from where we're talking about and what Isaiah's dealing with, is that the people of God don't just receive the blessing of God. We take what God gives us and we give it away. If God gives you a message, you got to preach it. <laughs> I remember when I surrendered to preach that night. I, I, I walked down, or that Sunday morning, I walked down the aisle and told the church that I was surrendered to preach. Billy Graham is in the house. I, if I had these boots on, They'd probably have fired the pastor and gave me the job right there on the spot. Right? I walked down the aisle. I said, God's called me to preach. They turn around and present me just like I got saved or something to the church. And these people's coming down, hugging my neck. Oh, you, oh, it's going to be so good. I remember that preacher over the back of my shoulder said, y'all be back tonight at 6 o'clock. God never called a man to preach. He didn't give a message to. We quit celebrating. I started mourning. <laughs> you talk about study. <laughs> Five hours of fury <laughs> at that dining room table, sweat, pen, paper. It looked like a, like a, a tax person during tax season, you know. I had stuff going everywhere just trying to put together some kind of message which didn't make any sense at all. It was all just a big mess. But I just did the best I could to get whatever God had put in my heart and get it out. When God gives you something, you got to give it away. And that's what Isaiah's telling them. Even though it's drought, even though you're in captivity, even though you're suffering, even though it makes sense to hide your blessing, hoard your blessing. You got to give it away. You got to live to give. You got to keep doing what God has called you to do and put you there to do. You got to keep being a blessing. And notice what he says, talking about this generational hand of God, talking about God blessing us with the intention of blessing others, blessing us with the intention of blessing generations to come, blessing us with the intention of blessing all those around us when he blesses us. I pray that God pour out a blessing on Antioch Baptist Church that we can't contain, that it has to get out of here. And help somebody. God has to get out of here and bless somebody else. When he talks about this, he says this. That you're going to be like a watered garden. That's a good thing. You ever seen a garden without water? And then you've seen a garden that's been watered. It's a, it's a good thing. Because a watered garden is what? Fruitful. A watered garden will produce. Now what happens when a garden gets watered and it produces? Everybody gets to eat. <laughs> right? You don't just walk by and say, what a lovely garden, and let the tomatoes dry up and die on the vine. You pick them and bring them to the preacher, Brother Buster, right? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> when, when, when you go, but Peter Branch called me one day and said, you want some habanero peppers? I said, no, I do not, <laughs> right? 
They have well, overflow with having their pet. When you water something and you take care of something and it produces, it, it, you want to bless other people with that. Miss Ann makes a big pot of jelly and everybody in the church gets blessed, right? We put selling a jar of it for $40 at the fall festival. Somebody wants some jelly. I ate some the other day. We ate some yesterday. Peach jelly. Great. Oh, Lord, I'm going to go home. Hear what I'm telling you now. When the garden's watered, everybody's blessed. When the garden's watered, everybody, you, you can plant a garden no bigger than this room in here. Of course, this would be a big garden, but you can plant one the size of one of these rows of pews in here, and your family couldn't eat everything that, that garden came out of, came out of that garden. It's an incredible thing how a watered garden produces, but here's what he said. Not only is it going to be a watered garden, but in that watered garden, you're going to be a spring of water. <laughs> what does that mean? That means there's a continual supply. A content you go to a spring, there's water coming out of it. Get a bucket, hand it off, turn around, more water. <laughs> you picking up what I'm putting down? This would have been good if I'd have preached it right. Get the bucket of water, hand it off, look around, there's more water. Get, you pick a tomato off the vine, hand it to somebody, turn around, there's another tomato. Why? Somebody watered the garden. <laughs> Live to give. Keep blessing, keep serving, even in the drought, even in the dry season. What he's saying is, is God in the drought will drive, when everybody else is sitting in dust, they're going to drive by your garden and look at that watered garden. Why? Because you were willing to be guided by the hand of God. And not only are you going to have the garden that everybody looks at, listen to this, you're going to have the garden that everybody gets fed by. That's ministry. That's what we're here for. Living to give. Living to do those things that even in the dry season, we continually do those things with what God's given us to be a blessing. Listen to this. He said you're going to be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters fail not. That, that supply will never be cut off. You know, Jesus said this, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and I'll give him a drink. And he said, and I'll make in his bosom, I will make flow from his bosom springs of living water. What he's saying is, is I'm going to give you something that you can't give away. And you keep giving, 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 giving. Got a little basket of fish, a little basket of bread, a couple of fish, a couple pieces of bread. 5,000 people need to be fed. He gave them baskets. He prayed over it. Those disciples are walking around, reaching in that basket, giving people fish and bread. Billy, every time they reached in there, was more fish. Every time they re that, uh, now I know the boy didn't have but a couple pieces of fish, a couple pieces of bread. I didn't give a couple of that away. I reached back. There's more fish. There's more bread. The biggest tragedy of the day would have been if they'd have gave away the number the boy brought to the table and said that's it. But they kept reaching back in the basket, and they kept reaching back in the basket, kept reaching back. It was so much food and fish that they fed five thousand people that day and picked up what was it, twelve baskets of leftovers. Now you ain't gonna leave an Antioch fellowship with twelve baskets of leftovers. Right? No, I know we get to go place out of there all the time. But it's an incredible thing to think about what God's able to do with what we're willing to do. It's not about talent. It's not about ability. It's not about skill. It's not about our substance. It's about us just opening our heart and being willing to be used of God. And that's what Isaiah is hitting these people for. They're in captivity. They're not able to work and make. They're basically slaves. They're not able to go work and make big money. They're not able to have great possession. They have been robbed of everything God had ever given them. And Isaiah said, keep giving. Keep serving. Keep ministering. Because God's going to bless you in the drought. He's going to make you like a watered garden. He's going to bring through you springs of water. And that supply of water is never going to fail. That's the kind of thing to put a little pep in your step. That and white cowboy boots. 2 Corinthians 9, 7, Paul said every man according as he purposes in his heart. I love that because he didn't say every man according as he has provision in his wallet. But he said according as he has purpose in his heart. He said let him give. Not grudgingly, not of necessity, for God loveth the cheerful giver. Now I heard about a church, I pick around, I talk about black church, I've got black preacher friends. I don't ever mean that irreverent or racial or anything like that. I mean I love black folks and black churches, I enjoy going to them really. The time or two that I've been, went to a black funeral one time. We had revival for three hours, <laughs> but anyhow, <laughs> I heard a story one time about a church that had their, their deacons. People that signed up to tithe had to make, when they joined the church, they had to fill out paperwork, said how much they made and how much their tithe was going to be. And if they didn't get their tithe, they sent the deacons to their house to collect their tithe. Now that sounds like a good idea, except that's not biblical giving. 
Because if you've got to go shake people down for their tithe, they're not going to be blessed for giving it, and you're not going to be blessed with it. You're just going to get a handful of money. You can't do nothing with that. God doesn't love somebody that gives out a grudge. He, you knock on the door and think, oh, Lord, it's the deacons. Here they come. <laughs> right? God blesses a cheerful giver. He said he loves them. God loveth a cheerful giver, one that's excited. I love the stories about churches that when they say, all right, it's time to take up the offering. Hey, I love Miss Wanda's piano playing. I love to hear her play the piano. I love the way she plays the piano. And I thank God that when we take up the offering, she don't play funeral song. Amen? And she plays something that makes me feel like I'm at church. We'll sing about the blood. She'll play victory in Jesus. We, I mean, just it's always something wonderful. I mean, I love that kind of music. That's the way it ought to be. When we, I love the churches I've heard about that when they said, all right, it's time to take up the morning offering, people shout and clap and say, praise the Lord, because it's an opportunity to give. If you really think God gave you 100%, that 10% is not going to mean anything to you. You know that's God's. If you really think God gave you seven days to live, giving him one back is not a whole lot to ask. And apparently it is for a lot of folks. Those are the ones who I wonder if they believe he really gave it to them. But for those of you who are faithful to church, you know what I mean when I say Sunday's not asking a whole lot for people that he gave every breath to, right? For us to carve out a few hours on a Sunday and come up here and worship him. And what a privilege it is. And when you think about the very character of God, of all the things we can do, there's nothing more Christ-like than giving. And again, I ain't just talking about money. I'm talking about just giving time, effort, Anything, because money is just a part of that when you, get, when you give yourself to be whatever it is. If you live to give, you'll give whatever, whatever that might be. You're never more like Jesus than when you're giving. John 3.16 is a picture of that, of what God, for God so loved the world that he gave. He gave. And he didn't just give a tithe. He gave the best thing he had to give. He gave his son so that we could have life, never perish, and we can sit here tonight and worship him. So I'm going to read the verse one more time. The Lord shall guide thee continually and satisfy thy soul in drought and make fat thy bones and thou shalt be like a watered garden and like a spring of water whose waters fail not. Live to give. Father, we love you. We thank you tonight that we got to come to church. And God, I pray you take this message and bless it to our heart. And as we close out this year, I ask you, Lord, help us to go toward and embrace what lies ahead of us with an attitude of ministry. God, that whatever it is, if we can give a helping hand, if we can give, a, a Lord, just a, a kind comment to somebody that's in need, Lord, if we can be a blessing to them financially, if we can be a blessing to them, uh, uh, Lord, by, by just loving on them, praying for them, uh, helping them, cooking them a meal, whatever it might be, I pray, God, that you'd help us to just embrace the ministry, whatever it is, however, wherever, that we can be a blessing to people because you have been more than a blessing to us. As we open this altar and give an invitation, if there's one that needs to be saved, if there's one that needs to, to come pray, if there's one with a special need in their life tonight, I pray that they'd feel free tonight to come to this altar and get it settled. We're going to thank you for what you do and for what you've done today. And it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen.